the Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast. All right, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Mark Wilson. He is an entrepreneur, founder of CWDL, Certified Public Accountants, a rapidly growing assurance, tax, and entrepreneurial services firm. He's the managing partner and is responsible for the vision and direction of the practice. CWDL is the recognized CPA firm leading the mortgage industry. Am I right? That's right. And prior to this, he had founded a privately held mortgage bank and served as CFO for multiple financial service firms. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah. Stoked to have you back. Yeah. Yeah, It's a, you always have do a good job and um, make everybody feel welcome. So thanks for having me here. Thank you, man. Well, last mm-hmm. time we were, we were at the old, at the old studio, the yeah. old office, and the market was totally different. Totally different market. We are in a very different market right now. Yeah. It's really hard. I mean, uh, a lot of our clients are really suffering. Um, I don't have a lot of easy calls yeah. uh, going on right now with, with business owners. So it's been I mean, a tough some market. Some people have said in, you know, if I was a retail broker, I might say the same thing, but that it, this is similar to the, as far as like their business dropping is 08. And, and I mean, some people might be experiencing that some others aren't, but you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean the, how fast rates accelerated up, yeah. um, along with, with the market changing, I think, you know, people looking to, to move, um, are kind of frozen waiting yeah. to see what happens. So, so the consumer themselves has, has kind of depleted the, um, the inventory that exists in the marketplace on an, in a normal market. Right. And um, that how fast rates went up really, really made it difficult for a lot of, a lot of lenders out there. So, I mean, I feel like it just took the wind out of the sales of like of most people's business. And so then you're kind of just sitting there floating and you're like, well, what do I do? Do you grab your paddles and you just hustle or do you do, you, you know, like what, what do you do when you're just sitting there floating? Are you waiting for the next, next wind you know, but which I, can't, I think it goes towards, you know, are you going to be proactive or reactive, right? And right now it's like kind of hard because you don't know where the wind's going to blow and what's going to happen. And But I do know that there are firms, and you probably know some of them too, that are grabbing the paddles and they're hustling and they're making, a, making business. Maybe it's not the same business they had before. It's not the same margins. It's not the same, you know, volume, but they're doing stuff. They're making... Yeah, no, look, I've, I've been in, in this industry for over 20 years, um, uh, both as a lender and, and now service, serving the uh, mortgage industry in particular. And um, loan officers and mortgage companies have to work extra hard. That's back to really hitting the pavement, building relationships with um, realtors and, and, and making a difference and, and earning the business, right? Selling right. the rates, going back to the fundamentals of what it takes to be a really good broker in this yeah. market. Yeah. So you started out in the business as a what, like as a mortgage broker, or how'd you start? No, no. I started off as a CPA. We were auditing um, mor- mortgage brokers back then uh, with their FHA approved needed to get an audit done. And I was fresh out of college, and um, a lot of the clients we we were taking care of were were brokers, and they were making a ton of money. And I killed myself. You saw, you were like I killed myself all. to get my CPA, and I'm like, "What are these guys doing? They're making all this money." And um, I kind of just dug in and and learned the business. It was very, really, really interesting to me, and um, just found how how everybody made money in the business. And then um, eventually got recruited to be a CFO of one of my clients, who was a seller and servicer of debt. Um, got recruited again to be a CFO of a mortgage bank. Um, that rolled into me figuring out I could do it myself. And mm-hmm. I started a mortgage company. Um, we built that up, went through all the GC approvals, um, primarily focused on FHA at that time. And um, the market changed on us and we had a very difficult time, similar to this this particular moment. And, Is that 08? Yeah, 08. Yeah. And, and we were really trying to navigate that. And I thought I was grasping for experts in that particular time um, and just really didn't find anybody that could serve what I was looking for. Um, eventually went to my partner group and they bought me out and decided I was going to build a firm specifically for this industry to navigate market cycles and the compliance and complexities that, that we're facing and um, never looked back. And, since that time, we've we've been able to do that, but um, 
but I learned a lot through that journey mm-hmm. and um, and what what really makes a good mortgage company and that's really who we serve but obviously their client base is oftentimes the loan officers and um, how you how you motivate them and and help support them to, to do really good business has been been an interesting path for sure. Yeah, and you have an interesting perspective on, you know, all these different mortgage companies you work with. I mean, I, if I were to guess, you probably work with over a dozen, right? I mean, how many mortgage no, companies? No, over 100. Over 100? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then you have a real vast yeah. uh, perspective yeah. on what's going on right now, right? I mean, so, yeah. so I mean, my point was going to be like, you get to see like, hey, this guy's doing this wrong, this guy's doing this right, this, this girl's doing this, that, you know. So, we, let's talk about right now. I mean, right now you're, you're, I'm sure, talking with the owners of these mortgage companies and people and seeing kind of what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong and kind of advising them. But what, what are you seeing that some people are doing right right now? I think, you know, I think mortgage companies who are looking at their product offering and being creative with that, I think that's a big, a big, um, a big benefit. Obviously, the jumbo market is incredibly difficult, so finding solutions for that particular business is is hard. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time talking with clients about locking in their ability, their their profit, which is very difficult. I mean, most most mortgage companies are not making money right now. Um, so, if you're listening, don't feel bad that you're not making money. This right. is just one of those times, no, right? You got to. You got to yeah. be able to weather the storm. I mean, then- like 80% are not making money. Yeah. And um, and hopefully that's changing. Uh, right now, we've had a, a little bit of a, a lift in some applications. But um, but so, so what does that mean? Um, it, you know, the MBA puts out a stat that says the average cost to produce a loan mm-hmm. is in their neighborhood of twelve to $13,000 wow. per loan. Wow. So... Um, Companies that are attacking that particular number aggressively, really focusing on getting way more efficient with how they they run their business, um, and then having some difficult conversations. If you're if they're a retail shop with their loan officers, it's it's hard. I mean, loan officers are typically making you know 120 plus basis points per deal, um, and in a competitive marketplace, that often puts them out of the market, right? Mm-hmm. So. You know, you have you have your cost of funds plus house margin plus LO comp. If you have to deliver a rate at that amount, in you oftentimes it puts you completely out of the market, and then um, and then you have to go and and ask for a concession or other things with your lender. Um, it creates a very difficult position for that lender, and right. so the so you know the companies that manage that really well. Um, are doing better than those who don't. Yeah, that was a long answer to your question. But, yeah, <laughs> the new product. There's new some product. Um, you seen people getting important into relationships. You know, I, non-QM. Like, are, are people getting into non-QM? Non-QM right now? is there. Yes, a lot of people are getting into non-QM. I think it's a, a huge opportunity. A little better margins. Um, some you know some really good um, solutions to other problems. You know, we have consumer debts running up. There's some you know, refinance out of, out of more expensive debt opportunities. Um, and like there's, there's going to be trillions of dollars of mortgages written over the next year. Um, so loan officers who focus on the relationships that matter the most, um, will be the winners in that yeah. marketplace. Right? right. And those who are hoping the phone rings by themselves is going to, are they going to struggle? And, um, yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a nice run, right? It was like, yeah. what was it? How many years was it? There was, it was a incredible. phone rang, and then you just sent out an email, hey, who wants to lower their rates? And then you know, send it out to fifty people, and you got forty responses, and you're like, yeah. all right, I'll do all these loans. And I mean, that those days are over; they're gone. Right. I think I read something, and I don't hold me to this stat because I'm going to screw it up. But okay. something like there was over four hundred regist- uh, registers MLOs. A year ago, and it's somewhere in the two hundred thousand range. Oh, so like half. almost half just dead. of the LO workforce has not renewed or and evaporated. Interesting. Um, so, what does that mean for those people that are still in the business? Um, it feels like there's more competition because there's less less oper- loans. Less loans, but those those LOs and those companies that do the right thing to position themselves in the marketplace will disproportionately win when things change. 
So um, I think, you know, professionals that r- take that part serious and invest in the relationships they need today will, will win in the, in the future. And yeah. I think that's a, um, I think that's, that's definitely an opportunity in this current market. Yeah, absolutely. So um, like what, what challenges are you seeing, you know, from, from your perspective, you know, obviously they're not making money right now, they're losing money, but how does that affect their approvals with FHA, with HUD, with all these, like if they're, if they're, you know, massive losses or if they have losses ongoing, is that going to jeopardize the company's viability or the company's ability to do FHA and VA and all that? Yes. Um, you know, there, I, I, I would say, I say yes, but so if, if you are a company and you, you reach out to your regulators, um, warehouse lenders, your counterparty people, um, and let them know it's coming and you have a plan, you can work through some of those difficult um, issues. But when you're out of compliance and you're out of compliance too long, you're out of business. And, um, and unfortunately, we've had a few clients where that's happened. Um, I believe it. They, they didn't change quick enough. They um, made some very strategic, poor decisions. Um, and I don't blame them. I'll, I'll tell you, coming out of 2020 and 2021, there was this incredible like effort to recruit amazing loan officers and crazy operations people, and these and they were difficult to find. And all of a sudden, uh, companies started cutting their lower producing branches and loan officers and operations people. Um, the companies that were operating pretty efficiently discovered that and made that this that decision a little bit early. Mm-hmm. So. So some of these other companies looked at that and thought that was an opportunity, but not understanding that this market was going to take a while to go the other direction. Right. And so, um, you know, as a result of that, a lot of those companies are, are just didn't make it and they're not going to. And um, we also see some companies that know that they're in the market that, you know, it's difficult and they've decided just to get bare minimum and kind of wait it out until the market changes. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. It's a difficult time. It's a difficult time. Yeah. It's a difficult time. And, and, you know, especially as like an owner of a company, when we have to lay people off, it's a bummer. It totally Ugh. sucks because, you know, you, you really get to know these people and they're, they're hard workers. And it's just like, but, but the, the truth and reality is if you're, if you're negative for too long, the whole business fails. So you can't, you have to pare down. You have to trim, trim back and, and, you know, hope that you can rehire people later that you had and, it's a total bummer, but I think, you know, the reality is it's, it's required. It's, it's it, like you said, there's some that didn't make it because they didn't move quick enough. So, yeah, it's really, really hard. We, I, we were doing some round tables out in Texas recently. Um, we had a bunch of business owners there and we talked about layoffs and what the layoff strategy was for them. And a lot of them went through multiple layoffs um, because they, they didn't want to cut too fast, too deep. Um, and we talked about that, that, that pain on the, the actual culture of those businesses. Um, you know, nobody starts a company with the idea that they're going to have to cut. They don't right. sell people on the, on the vision of the company and then turn around and say, you know, we, we have to cut. But you can't, you know, there's a few things in this industry that you can control and there's a few things you can't. Um, Two things you can't control are as the the total inventory that exists out there to do business, right? And interest rates, you can't control <laughs> those two things. No, nope. and um, you control cost. Right. So and so, you only have a few areas where you can you can go to to uh, make those decisions. And your biggest cost is labor, and um, and the burden on the you know, that's kind of the 80, 20 rule the the 80% of, of your producers who aren't really producing takes a, a massive toll on your operational cost. And, sure. um, so anyway, it's getting that right. There's, um, yeah, I not to dwell on the sad stuff on the <laughs> tough stuff, but no, it's, it's, it's a sad reality, but it's something that we have to do I mean, yeah. and, and, as business owners and, and hopefully people listening, they understand. I mean, it's like, it's, just, this is cyclical. Yeah. It's, it's not our first time going through this. Some people that are new to the business have gone through this or haven't gone through it. But, um, you know, if you can hold on and you can 
figure out ways where there are bit where there is business, then you could right. I think you can thrive. It's just it's just a it's a it's just not easy. The low hanging they they say low hanging fruit for a reason, right? That's right. Because that's because what no one wants to climb to get the fruit. They just want to go. Oh, here's right. Oh, eat that fruit, right? right. So. But, but like there's a you, lot of climbers making a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, there's that. There's yeah. the other side. Just choose who you want to be, right? Right, yeah. right. And and if you're not willing to climb and work, then yeah, maybe go work in a different in, in a different industry or something. Yeah. But that's that's the thing is that you're right. We can't control where that the business has shrunk. So you have to figure out how to do the business in the new in the new right. reality, the new market. Right. Right. And try to capture more of the market share as a percentage of the total than you did before. So how can you help, say, someone listening that's a broker, you know, whether it's like, okay, maybe they, they were, were wholesale or not wholesale, maybe they were a retail broker and they never had an FHA or they never had a you know ability to do VA or, or, or um, Fannie. Could you help them like break into that? Is that like kind of what yeah. you do? Yeah, we can help them kind of guide them through through that process, the approval process. More uh, like banking, like how to be a, a Yeah, become banker. an independent banker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, interesting enough, uh, Freddie Mac has had a slower approval process up until recent. There's been um, some some pretty good lobbyists that have gone to F- Freddie and said, "Listen, you make this more difficult than it needs to be." So they are approving quicker now. That's good. Um, Fannie Mae's always been pretty pretty easy to deal with. Then Jenny Mae is still very difficult. Um, I believe it. Um, but there's a servicing component to that, so. The reason people go into that and it's become GSE approved is so they can uh, sell direct to those GSEs and create securities around that and, and participate in servicing revenue and yeah. sometimes get some better pricing. What about like mergers and acquisitions? Do you see that happening at all right now? There's a ton. There's a ton. Um, not your typical M&A work that is super exciting for the seller right, right. now. Um, but there is a ton of M&A going on. Um, we had multiple transactions last year um, where really um, companies are able to pull their balance sheet off. Um, the owners can take the cash out of the company, join another uh, bank and originate through there and, and take some, some additional opportunity. We've had some premium business happen in the M&A world. Um, if you have some good predictable um, revenue and you're growing through through proper channels um there is there we've we've seen some m a that's been better than i would have imagined that's good yeah because i I gotta imagine that people really i mean even though there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines there's people still want to do business and they want to grow like these are opportunity times right owning a house is still an important thing to do right and and um you know, it's it's most Americans' number one most important asset is right. the home, right? right? So that's not going to go anywhere, right? Um, and and yeah, there's there is a lot of opportunity out there. Were you asking about the money on the side for M and A or? Well, just I think the people want to grow their businesses, and they yeah. sometimes in these kind of down markets, they think of it as a time to consolidate, time to you know kind of take opportunities where they you know where they're oh, i can i i could have bought xyz lender last year for 20 million yeah. and now i can buy it for 10 so yeah you know, yeah it's, it's a good opportunity to right. get to get the to get that business as long as you're buying it for the right reasons um you know loan officers can go anywhere so it, ha- it just has to be the right the right match for those right for those situations to work yeah, I've seen and heard stories of, of lenders buying another lender and then everyone leaves. And they're yeah. like, what do I got? I got a shell and one less competitor, but you spent all this money. You know? That's right. Yeah, it happens a lot. Yeah, so, I can imagine. Yeah, it has to be the right, the right match. Usually the buyer has to have um, some way to convince everybody to, that, that they're going to be able to do more business and do it better than where they're coming from and um there are some really good ones out there that do that better than others Um, yeah so yeah that's good so let's talk about referrals cpas uh are obviously a great referral source right i mean and i think probably one of the ones that are you know is one of the most untouched or un you know underutilized referral source 
because the the glaring obvious one is real estate agents, yeah. right? And then the next one is probably banks or attorney, you know, other yeah. other places that we know like are very active in real estate. So, um, I remember getting a lot of business from CPAs when I was a broker, and it was one of my favorite things to do. If you find the right fit, like if you find a right, a right CPA that you can, you know, get along well with, that you know understands your products, can. You know, and also has a little bit of because most CPAs aren't necessarily salespeople, yeah, yeah. so they're not going to necessarily refer <laughs> you a lot of business new naturally. So you have to figure out how to drum up that business with the CPA or yeah. a CPA firm. Let's talk about that. How, like, if you were sitting down giving advice to your say, you had a son that was a broker starting out, yeah, and you're like, this is how you get business from a CPA. What are the secrets? Well, first you got to create a relationship with yeah, the number CPA one. number one right and you have to build build that trust because you know the CPA kind of cherishes those relationships so if they give a referral take really good care of them and right um you know and i think oftentimes you 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 get what you give so if you have some tax people you could, or something you can send to that CPA that probably helps. I think that's you a know? great way to look at life. Like I'm going to give yeah. you something you can get like yeah. versus take take take, yeah. right? Well, and not quid pro quo. I've right. I've said that wrong. But anyways, <laughs> but you but you know, but yeah. but it has to be kind of this mutual beneficial um relationship and and they're fun CPAs, I promise you out there and there's a lot of boring. So to decide where you fit in that and go build that relationship and you'll get a ton of business. When I used to do a lot of individual tax work, um, I had a mortgage guy that I sent all my business to because I knew they would take really good care of them, and um, and that was and that and I was happy, and they and they sent me business too, and yeah. um, and it worked out well. It was it was a really great relationship um, that yeah. that I think is is very very valuable. We'll send and a ton and of business. I think you know if if I'm just thinking out loud, but. I would I would assume that you're gonna if you if you like your CPA and you're a, you're a borrower right or a buyer whatever you're gonna trust the CPA with whatever they say and oh and God. and you're not as a CPA you're not gonna say oh you have to use this person but you're gonna be like look I think you should look into this product that he has or she totally. has right like I if it I'll tell you I I think in my experience when I've referred people out they went with the person it was um, right. You know, it's interesting being a CPA, they, especially one that does a lot of individual tax work. Um, generally, those people are sitting in your office and once they tell you their, their financial and how much money they make and you start talking about their kids, they open up to you. You, you learn about divorces and you know, mm -hmm. what's going on in their lives and all of these things, um, they become really open to... to um, to, to anything you have to tell them because you know you, you do create a bond and a relationship and you want what's best for them and they know that you don't really have a dog in the fight so when right. they get a referral um then when you give a referral i think i think it's great i um i know some people look for kind of like a kickback i i i've always thought that's first of all it's illegal but yes. but i i've always when i've had um lenders or even other industries like a lot of insurance people would reach out to us too um if they wanted to pay me, i would say i don't want to do business with you because i i want you to take care of my client i mean yeah, yeah. and so i think I'd, I'd caution that as the approach i think having a true relationship that that uh, is is meaningful and mutually respect um is shared then that's where you get most of your business i agree with that yeah so um something that a strategy that I think I would use if I was a broker right now with a CPA is you still get somewhat of a tax write off on a second mortgage, right? It is, not anymore. It, not anymore. So no, that's gone. That's is that gone. just a California or federal or it's, all of it? No, second homes have gone. Okay. So. Not now, second home. No, no. Second mortgage, not a second home. Second mortgage, yes. Okay. That's what I'm talking second about. Second mortgage, yes. Rental property, also yes. Yes. But, but does second home, no. Second home, no. So all your second homes need to be Airbnb rentals. rentals. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> But back to the second mortgage thing. So yeah. like if you have a second, you know, on top yeah, of your first. Yeah, first so and a second, you can deduct the interest. Um, if it's, if it's uh, primarily, well, if it's purchase money and it's under the cap, then yes. And if it's, um, and, and the other part, there's, there's uh, if you do improvements, there's a smaller amount that you can take as a deduction. 
So, so if you let's say you're a broker and there's no more firsts out there because there's lim- there's limited purchases we know right. the market's totally people shrunk. are moving when they have to right and and so there's limited amount of purchases there's a really really limited amount of refis unless they want cash out right Be- or unless they had an arm that's now adjusted a ton and they got they got to figure that out so my message to the world right now has been seconds yeah because if you can do a second now the, the most brokers are like i can't make any money on seconds i'm not gonna do a second like it's why let them go to the bank and get you know get their, their heloc but there is probably a pretty decent amount of people who did bank statement loans or did a, a non qm loan and have a ton of equity that could tap into those seconds now and, and question- what about the hassle too sometimes a non qm deal is less painful Right. right. And if you can yourself employed for sure. Yeah. And if you can get a second and even if you're not going to make a ton of money on doing a second, you have a relationship now. And you made them happy, you either help them accomplish a couple goals, whether it was consolidating all those 25 percent interest rate credit cards. Yeah. Help them avoid, you know, selling off some of their business for capital that they would have regretted. Three, uh, maybe they helped them put in a pool that now their kids get to enjoy and they get to be home with their family more for whatever college kids vacations like so many reasons why you're 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 going to help that client relationship build if you if right. you do now i would think if you're a cpa you can kind of see the credit the the profile of what's going on in their business like if their business is drying up if they need more money to capitalize you kind of see that as their cpa and you're doing their P&Ls or whatever it is um i mean isn't that a perfect relationship to to it's a refer perfect seconds? relationship yeah yeah, I mean, you're you're helping mutual clients solve problems, right? Right, and um, it helps everybody, right? Be a client, you get a client for life because you helped make an introduction to to solve their problem. So it's a huge deal. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just trying to spread the word. I mean, I, just, yeah. I, wish, I wish they would. Yeah. They would st- but I are get you seeing it. a big uptake? Well, I mean, it's half seconds. our business. Yeah. It's at least half of our. It's yeah. more than half of our units. It's half of our volume. I mean. Yeah. So, I mean, whether or not people are taking advantage of it. It's so funny. A year ago, nobody talked about seconds. Or two yeah. years ago, nobody. nobody. And now, now it's a big deal, right? I mean, but you gotta be consumer make, debt's way up. It's way up. It's way up. People are maxing out their credit cards. Yeah. And I would think, too, that um, part of the depressing part is like, I got to do all this work. I'm going to get paid only on you know the $200,000 200, loan. So I'm going to make you know maybe $3,000 on it. Well, yeah, you get to you get paid to keep a relationship. Because someone else bucks? is going to do it, right? Three thousand a box. Yeah, three thousand to bucks. keep a relationship. Yeah, yeah, with your with your borrower, and yeah. then maybe they're going to refer someone to you. I mean, the reality is, it's just now things are going to take more work. That's it, all the way around. Tell us more about that. It's, Why is it? You've been through some cycles. <laughs> well, because it's you know there it, we have origination fees and discount points again, like yeah. that those disappeared for a while you know it's like right no co- no cost loan refi you know it's selling a rate it's it's uh because that's the market we're in um you have to adapt you gotta have to adapt i mean especially in this industry you right. know the one constant in this industry is change yeah so you know that's the one thing you can count on yep and um and it's highly regulated and it's complicated and um it's political Mm-hmm. And and as a result, uh, you know, lenders and the people who operate in this industry have to be um, flexible and and willing willing to work extra hard. And you know, I'm not dis- I, I sh- we shouldn't discount when times were good. Uh, when the market was, I say good, just because there's a ton of volume. That was hard too. I mm-hmm. mean, getting that work done and and uh, the amount of volume and the multiple relationships and and how th- the pain that put to an operation um was also difficult it was a different type of difficult though because there was a yeah. lot of revenue coming in to support that right? right um but you know i think i think loan officers are experiencing what their company's pain is and that's you know I'll, the companies have given back a big portion of their balance sheet over the last year. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that eventually will have to fall at the loan officer level. And, um, and, and they're, 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 and, and obviously operation staff have already felt a big part of it. And loan officers have too. I mean, the volumes, everybody participates in that. Right. So, um, but yeah. 
Let's talk about wages. Uh, in 2021, there was just crazy wages going out to, Nuts. to ops yeah. and to, to anyone, right? Like, and so this supply is and all, demand, right? We had, yeah. uh, it, you know, there wasn't anybody looking for work, but there was all kinds of work that needed to be done. And so people would go to the next job with the higher pay, right? Yep. And then, you know, when things shifted, now it's like, okay, well, I don't have to pay an underwriter that much anymore. Or I don't have to pay, you know, this much on BIPs anymore. So there's a shift back over towards less. Now, how's that playing out? I mean, I, I, I can't, it's never fun, right? It's never fun to say like, oh, sorry, you don't get a bonus this year. Or, oh, sorry, we're going to have to lay off more people. And then the new people you hire, you know, you're paying them a little less than you would have paid the ones that you hired last year. I mean, like, I mean, from the owner's perspective, I tell them it doesn't do you any good keeping everybody at the same rate and you're out of business two months from now versus, and so you have to let them all go in two months anyway, right? You might as well make the tough decision today so you can survive. So you can hire them back. You can pay them more money when the market comes back. Right. Um, you know, it doesn't do them any good to go out of business. You no. know, who does that help? It's the, you know, um, great. You lasted an extra month, but now everybody, you have to fire everybody, including yourself, and you've ruined yourself financially right. um, in the process. Um, that doesn't help anybody. Mm -mm. It really doesn't. And and it's kind of a cold reality of being an entrepreneur, not just in this industry, but in any industry. If if you're if you're facing some really difficult forces that are external and out of your control, you owe it to yourself and everybody who works for you to make the decisions to survive. Because if if you don't, everybody's out of business. It yeah. doesn't do you any good. Right. So what did you do? You know, yeah. I I had a I had a client actually um who left the big bank in the middle of 21 and started his own shop. And uh, the bank was actually winding down operations. They had a crystal ball apparently. <laughs> and, um, and so he made promises to all of the operations people and all the loan officers to come on board and follow him. And, and, uh, he went and propped up a new mortgage bank, actually bought a mortgage bank that had some tickets. And the, the down part about that story is he's pretty much liquidated his entire net worth up mm. until this point. Mm. And I talked to him two weeks ago and he still had over a hundred employees and they're doing like eight deals a month. Jeez. And, and I, I, I just begged him to, to at least furlough people because it's just, and, and I, um, he's, his, he's of the opinion he'd rather, rather just go down and, um, and that's what's going to happen. And, right. um, I don't know who that helps. No. Um, I don't know who that helps. I guess. I mean, that, that's the thing about entrepreneurs is the ones that make it, you have to be gritty. You got to, it's, it's, yeah. you can't be sensitive and go, you know, we're a family. I mean, the, the only ones that survive are like, no, I got to shift and be nimble and yeah. I got to do, make hard decisions. Right. It's not fun. Not fun. I mean, I've run a few businesses and gone through all the ups and downs and it's, it's hard. Letting people go is the worst part about being an entrepreneur. It does. Because yeah, you've sold like, them on your dream, right? Yeah. And they trusted you. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like failure yeah. to you and to me. I've, done, I've had to be there. I've had to fire or let everybody go, including myself. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And, um, and they're better off too. Let's face it. If you're working for a company that is suffering and you are and there's not enough work for you to do mm -hmm. you know it right um and and maybe there's an opportunity for you that you'll be better off in any way um you know and then and then the other part of that argument which is always hard is you might have people that work for you that that are really a players they're really amazing um and they're taking a pay cut so you can keep other people on who are not. 
It's a and, good point. Wow. Yeah. And that and that that also will hurt a culture almost worse than doing strong layoffs. Yep. So that's that's hard truth right there. Yeah. yeah. So um I don't know. We we went I just did a I was at the MCT is a hedge advisory firm in the mortgage space and we they had their conference and I was running a round table with a bunch of people there. And you know we we talked I said okay we we've gone through all these difficult conversations but let's finish on what the opportunities that exist yeah. in the in there because there are you know we've touched on some of those but there's still opportunities and um I think the glaring issue we're facing right now is just how difficult this market is and so what I'm are, sure speaking you're of opportunities what do you think are some missed opportunities some easy like Ooh, wow, wow, I'm surprised this company's not doing this. Like, what are some missed opportunities? On the relationship side, you know, I think there's some crazy stat that there's a certain level of transactions that will always exist. Right. You know, death, divorce, uh, forced moves, relocation. So find ways to own those relationships. And especially in recessions, there are a lot of divorces, yeah. unfortunately. So now's the time probably to get some relationships with CPAs and attorneys, maybe some divorce attorneys, and be like, look, let, let, you know, let me help you out. And Right? Like, that's, that's, right. A, that's a missed opportunity. That's a missed opportunity. And I'm sure that's growing. And then, yeah, what else? Um, products. Make sure you, ho you have enough products to meet what your customers' needs and demands are. I think your seconds were a very good example of that. Yes, believe it. Yeah, yes, do it. Just come on, people. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not doing them, get into it. That's right. Um, I think loan officers who are in retail shops who are losing deals based on price, having the courage to understand that if they could lower their comp plan so they can be more competitive mm. might have them disproportionately win Ouch. in a this is, this is difficult a market. Yeah, I mean, that means like, you know, take a little less, right? I mean, take a little less. Maybe you do more deals, more deals, a little less, work a little harder. Do you make the same? Correct. Uh, yeah. I mean, more relationships. I mean, the, the owners of the companies have given up a ton of their balance sheet, right? Right. And, and they want to serve their loan officers. They do, um, you know, but I feel like oftentimes that's a, it's the it's the only like a loan officer goes in interviewing the company, not the other way around. It's like the one unique relationship right. that exists that an employee is actually usually interviewing the company, not the other way around. Right. Um, so there's there's some there's some truth for you all there. Um, I mean, can you imagine being an owner and having a loan officer come to you and say, "Hey, I, I see that we're struggling, and I see this market. I get it. You know what? Let me lower my comp plan." Just, I think so we can I can get, more, get business. more deals. Yeah, so I can get more, more deals, help the company. You know, I see you guys are, you know, you're taking, you know, pay cuts or we're having to lay people off. I don't want to, I'd hate for you to have to lay, lay off Jody. You know, like she's, she's been awesome here. Let me, let me like lower my comp plan. Let me get some more business. Here's my plan. Right. When the market you changes, if, I want to come back and I yeah, want to raise, I'll raise it. it. Yeah. Like, could you imagine if a broker said that or a loan officer said that to you as, as an owner? Like that would be. Oh like, my God. you would keep that person forever, forever. and that's yeah. going to give you some new fire in your belly to like, yeah, let's, we could rally together and be, you know, be awesome again. Like, yeah. Like if you have teammates like that, that are willing to, you know, absolutely give up a little bit to, to make the team work. It, that's huge. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Um, so that's one area that I don't see very often. Um, but yeah. I think it would be a huge, huge deal. Um, other missed opportunities. you know, selling the rate, looking at not, it's not all a fixed rate environment anymore you know, in arms, arms being flexible. Yeah. Um, you know, being I think like solution oriented, like what, what is it that you need? You need it. You need yeah. a lower payment. Are we going to consolidate your debts? Like pay off 25% interest credit cards or, you know, like save your marriage by going on a vacation, like whatever, you know, like right. you need a little relief, like yeah, I mean, what selling the benefit, right? What you're talking about is what my dad used to say. You have two ears and one mouth. So listen twice as much as you talk. So yeah. listen to your borrower and listen for their problems and how you can solve them. 
Because it's not always consultive. about rate. Right. It's not always about rate. You're exactly I remember right. like looking at a loan going, ah, this guy's never going to take this, this pitch that I'm about to pitch him. And I'm yeah. thinking like, I'm raising his interest rate. I'm, you know, I'm not going to give him that much cash. And then you call and you pitch it. And then the guy's like, I'll take it. And you're like, wait, what? And they're like, oh yeah, well, I actually need that 10 grand or, you know, my dad's going to remain in jail and I, I had to do bail or, you know, whatever it right. is. Like you don't, you don't know the whole story. And so right. don't be afraid to pitch a deal and don't like think that it's the guy's going to say no before you pitch it. Right. Like That's you never exactly know. Right. Or look at their credit report. Let's find exactly. out how to get their DTI down and, and, and see how you can get them qualified and put them in a, you know, it, it might not be one meeting. You might need to work with them for five or six months until they can qualify because you give them a path to pay off some credit card debt and some other things. And so they can get a loan. It's, it's back to really working for that relationship. I love that. Yeah. Relationships are so key because you're listening, like you said, just a minute ago, like if you can listen to them, find out what the need is and then provide a solution. That's, that's what, that's what we all start in this business for is like, we want to solve problems. We want to obviously want to make money, but it's like, we want to, you know, do deals and help people yeah. and get more business. And so, I mean, don't I, w I think you would agree with that. I mean, you want to do business with people who genuinely are trying to help you improve your life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A loan officer and a lender is in a unique position to have people own the biggest asset. Right of their lives, right? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And now, I mean, people are actually getting offers accepted versus before when it yep. was like, you had no chance because the cash buyers were like yep. scooping up properties. Now you might be able to go back and say, I can help these you know, young families or families get into a house for the first time. And, you know. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I think also educating your loan, your, your borrowers and I think I, I think it's it's common now you see as advertised, you know, marry the house, not the rate, because, you know, you'll be able <laughs> to refinance it later. Uh, but really explaining what that means. That's not so good for lenders, by the way, especially if rates drop, because then they'll get early payoff issues. But um, we'll deal with that when yeah, it comes. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and servicers and everything else don't love that story so much. But for for the, you know, boots on the ground, getting the deals in the door, that's a that's a important that's important sales pitch really or or at least education you know educating yeah. yeah something just popped in my head i want to ask you about um what is going to happen with all these two and a half percent 30 year fixed loans like going to stay there forever ever right i mean like i mean why but, would they refinance the only reason to refinance those is, is they have to have either to. die or they're divorced they or ran up their debt too much right on their which they might, yeah. you know, um, people tend to do that. Uh, but, but I think what I was asking more on the, on the other side of, of the people, the investors. So all these, what mortgage backed security owners who own a piece of the mortgage backed security, all these big firms, they're all sitting on this, this super low fixed debt. I mean, as I mean, That's, Silicon Valley bank, they had, some, right? had a lot. Yeah. So what, what, like, Talk about that a little bit because that to me is 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 a problem, right? Like there's like that money is 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 it's it's the value of it, right? The, they had to mark it down, like the the value of those those debts, those those uh, securities, they had to mark them down, right? Because they're not they're they're less valuable. It's not that they're less valuable; it's the opportunity cost, right? So if you're, you're sitting, at, you have capital tied I, up. I have tied up capital in smaller returns than if I pulled it out and put it in a CD. Can you imagine? Right. Oh you God. can get a CD that pays better <laughs> than a bond, than, I, than a um, mortgage bond. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, it's it's an opportunity cost. I think that had a little bit to do with what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, and that they had money tied up, and they there was an opportunity cost to carrying that that load, and wanted to get some liquidity to go buy some better return money. Well, it turns out it wasn't the greatest idea, but. And, and that's not the only reason. So I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on what happened there. Full right. Disclosure. But, um, but if you're looking at like a balance sheet and you see, you know, someone sitting on this, this low rate return, that's just the loser. Yeah. So the security component of it is an opportunity cost issue. The servicing value, which is the portion of, of that portfolio that you get paid for sending the payment out and getting it back, which could be, 
you know, point to point two five. There's some there's some regulatory numbers that go along with that. The servicing values are high. Yeah. Because servicing values are based on the duration of the debt. And as you can imagine, if you have a bunch of MSRs that you're looking mortgage service, right? Sorry, that that are you're carrying and they're low interest rate coupons, the chances of them refinancing are pretty low. So the servicing strip's worth some real money. Yeah, some never, money. it's not gonna roll off. But like the cost of fun and the, and the margin on the opportunity cost is, is real. So, so the answer to your question, I don't know. But, yeah. but the, uh, the Wall Street's gonna have to talk about that. And, and I do think securizations are gonna start to come back. So securizations is something that happened kind of in that, that pre wall street era um in that well in, in 06 7 8 which kind of got us in a little bit of trouble but um firms are looking at that again and coming back and, and start cdos and stuff starting to do some some securizations where they're putting together um you know strips where they can buy mortgage mortgages uh and which are more attractive now i mean you're yeah, doing six, 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 seven percent, seven percent yeah. mortgages. Um, you know, insurance companies like that. There's a lot of money coming back into the market, so there's a lot more investors coming back in. So, so it was Fannie, Freddie, Jenny. That's where the money had been going because, but now the returns are better, so other people are looking at that. So there's going to be opportunities for for businesses also. Uh, mortgage lenders in particular to have some new investor and a new investor hmm. money coming in yeah, that uh, makes sense. because it's a better return. Right. So um, whereas and, like it was just the GSEs buying that was right, it. Right. Right. And the GSEs will also hedge their, you know, they're going to put, they're going to buy some fives and some sixes to offset some of their twos and threes. Yeah. They'll blend but, it in. And, yeah. So they'll figure it out. They'll this figure guy, it this, out. This is what they're paid to do, right? right? These Wall Street guys. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I was supposed to be in DC talking to those guys today, but I had a conflict. But yeah. Well, you had to come and talk to me. I would prefer to be here. <laughs> the tequila is better here. Yes, yeah, we yeah. have good tequila here yeah. for sure. Um, what are your thoughts on non-QM? It's a great option for the right bar, you know. Um, do you think it's we're going to have any issues like we did in 2020 where like this Wall Street said, we're not going to buy it. Like what? What's the hmm. risk there? Like what? What's the risk? There's of, always a risk. There's I always I mean, a risk. It's, it's not a riskless business. It's not. That's why. Um, yeah, I mean, I think but they're paying. Like the mortgages paying. are paying. Here, here, here's what I think about non QM and and jumbo. If I can put jumbo into that that um, same bucket, you know, to me, it's ridiculous that. Um, investors will give you hits on jumbo business and non QM because typically these are people who are usually higher earners that have bigger homes and <clears throat> and are pretty low credit risk overall. Right, more down, usually. more down. Mm -hmm. um, so why are there LPAs? Why why are you hit? Why are there all these hits on on yeah. these loans, which I think are better performing in the long run? Right. I think you're right, and so. Um, for me, I think that is a, it's a, it's a, I think what I was saying about more investors coming in, I believe that there's going to be a bigger appetite for that type of business going forward. And I think it makes sense that it should be because these are, that I hate the name non QM. I hate the it's name. It's the stupidest name ever. So Can whoever is it? in charge. Let's change it right now. It's like qualified mortgage how about that let's just switch it around <laughs> more m m q yeah like <laughs> more qualified more qualified like Loves. um i you know i i think as long as as it as it stays that way if that's the underwriting criteria there i'm sure there are there's products out there that can get into the higher risk category which would hurt non qm yeah, it would um but I think there's there's sh there's an opportunity for a lot of that business to to do well, and I do think there's some sophisticated investors that are looking at those products uh, with a bigger appetite. Yeah, I think over time, right? You let enough time go by, you let let enough like enough history of payments go. You you look at kind of okay, LTVs. What really caused the crisis? It was people yeah. were underwater. 
you know, people had no skin in the game. They felt like they were glorified. It was printers. an algebra equation. Right. Like a quant. Yeah. These yeah. quants can go doop, 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 yeah. doop, and then they're gonna go, ah, this this is a lower risk loan than actually your government loan. I right? mean like jumbos a, all day. Like, all day. Uh, all day jumbo loans yeah. are like why are there hits on jumbo loans? I should have, be cheaper. Actually. Should be cheaper. Because then you could cross sell them and get their deposits. If loans which are, is what banks want. If loans are are priced based on risk, yeah. Why are there hits on jumbo? <laughs> I know. I guess it's bigger, more risk, but I, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like like ten, ten, two hundred thousand dollar borrowers versus one two million dollar borrower. You know, what are the odds that maybe two of those ten, you know, ten borrowers are going to go bad versus right. the one? You know, but the one. But what's the LTV on the two? Right, right. And you have way better. And how many of the the two million dollar houses? A lot of those properties don't dip as fast and as hard. Like it, it all meshes together. But you're right. I mean, I guess you're right. There's there you spread risk amongst more borrowers. Um, but I think it's old equation. It's old thinking. It's it, it's yeah. not. You know, they need to adjust. I think maybe we should go see Wall Street and talk to them. Yeah, I have a little conversation. Right, right. <laughs> Over some tequila. <laughs> right. I hope, yeah. As long as Wall Street plays right. Yeah. But yeah. 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 But I think that I think there's going to be opportunity in that because there's more investors coming to this asset class, which I think is good overall. It'll make it a healthier market. Overall view on the economy. I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but like if you were to try to reach into. I think we're, we're, it feels, <laughs> and, and indications are. <laughs> It's it's going to be a little bit tough for a little bit. Yeah. Um. I think, I think there's going to be tough, but with that, there's opportunities. People do well in down markets and up markets. Um. So we'll see. I mean, I I I'm not an expert on the economy. Um. You think rates are going to keep going up? Another another hike, or do you think we're going to stop? Short term rates. I think. Based on what they said last week, um, I think they're going to have to slow down. I, I think there's a lot of, sad to say, good news for mortgage rates right now um, with all the layoffs that are happening. You know, Disney, um, right. a lot of big companies are laying people That's off. That's what they wanted. They wanted they there wanted to be that. like some job, the, the job it's, market needed it. It's the inflation, right? right? So they're, they're, and they're using, they have one thing in their toolbox which is short-term rates lever yeah and the problem with that is i i don't know if interest rates were the cause of inflation I, you know no pe uh, people just printing money printing money <laughs> ppp you know eidl I mean, and all, free, here's, 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 uh, oh there's money in your account there's now. money we're, we're gonna send you out money like you know um if you look at this labor stats i don't know if you looked at it by age group but mm -hmm. like the unemployed um like the the most employed group are people my age like in the in the you know late 40s early 50s and every other group other than that are available like not not in the workforce somewhere i don't they know do where it. they're doing where they're at they're but influ they're, they're influencers they're influencers <laughs> i don't know are they're not recording their income or they're they're there's a gig economy or mom and they're dad are paying or Uber i don't Eats or something yeah right? but i'm talking in both directions and, and i understand the baby boomers are retiring and leaving the workforce rapidly right now but um it's an incredible moment of time and i don't know where it's going um well i know where it's going what, tell me. So this AI, AI? stuff uh, is yes. just mind blowing. S seismic. I think it's going to be seismic. I think it's. I think we're all underestimating what's going to happen. I, I'll tell you right now. I have a full team of developers working on AI for our firm around the clock. I mean, I could see it disrupting accounting, legal work, mortgages, underwriting. I mean, artists. The stuff that we thought would never be affected yeah. by AI till later, right. like art, artwork, like lyrics, like music, songwriters. My daughter's a songwriter. She, I mean, Ella Maddox, go look her up on Spotify. She's awesome. <laughs> Check her out. Yeah. But like, she even told me today, and she's about to go to, to university for songwriting next year or after next year. So 2025. Um, and she's like, dad, these, these AIs can write songs. Oh. Like, 
my kids. The and whole it's thing. the worst they're going to be. Yeah. Like AI right now is the worst it's going to be. And it's already doing stuff that we never thought it could do. So what, oh, no. what is going to happen to the workforce? I, I think that's, I think the answer scary. to the question is it's scary, but there's also opportunity in it. Right. Um, Humans will find voids for to fill their time. Yeah. Um, I, I I've thought about what does that mean for commercial real estate too. I mean, are we going to have empty offices all over the place? And then, um, but people are going to have to go somewhere. Does that mean retail picks up like mad? And there's more restaurants and more people eating out because live music, live music. Um, it's gonna it's going to be very interesting. Is there gonna be a universal wage that comes out because there's not enough work to go around? I mean, you you can let your mind go down a rabbit hole on what it looks like, but mm -hmm. and I think you should, especially if you're just an entrepreneur. Just to know what the yeah, the best and the worst case, right? I mean, just just yeah. to, to be kind of aware. Yeah. I mean, I know I know I'm we're paying attention to it, like I said, and um we we I I personally believe it's going to create a seismic change in how we do business and the things that we hold important and, and from a task perspective is going to go completely away. Yeah. So maybe that allows us to focus on more high value things that's worthwhile. And I think it's good for our society to say, you know what, I need some skills in something versus like. I'm just going to drive or I'm just going to, you know, do, do you're not going to need to drive anymore. No, like, like, like mindless skills. Like let's go, go, go. You know, people are going to need a plumber still always. Oh God. They, plumbers. Tell me, tell me when you get a, when you have somebody walk in who wants a loan, who's a plumber. Yeah. You're, they're I always going to have business. They're always going to have business. They make a ton of money. Dentists. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. Like this, contractors, all, I mean, all that kind of stuff, anything physical, but like it is kind of, you know, interesting, some of these white collar jobs are going to be gone. Like, I mean, I agree. I, I, have you heard that China has a, I think it's a judge that's an AI that's like, that's putting out dispositions and judgments and, yeah. And like, and, and like, you're sentenced to five years in prison. Like, I mean, an AI based on the crime and they go through all of the, I mean, it, it's, it's, if they can do that, then China they can, scares me. But yeah. But like, I mean, yeah. legal work, right? Like, yeah. we're counting. Like, yeah. You can yeah, have one no. person inputting stuff and well, you don't have to input it. anymore, right? So you just I can write it. I can write. Maybe I'll be able to write. I need this all reconciled. Go, and it will just go through. It'll log in all the bank accounts. It'll do all the work. Reconcile it. Um, deliver financials. I mean, ask you some questions that you can answer, and but yeah. you don't need an army of CPAs to run a CPA firm anymore, right? Like you probably yeah. could bring it down to. But I, I, I say yes. I, I think there's still going to be strategic stuff that that will be needed. I think a lot of the mundane, like the amount of time we spend for our accounting clients to go in and log in everybody's different bank accounts and download stuff and put it in and input it, all of that, I can see going away. Um, like the amount of time that it takes for us to do multi-state tax returns. You know, most of our clients are probably filing in over 30 states and we have to apportion revenue and employees and we have to know tax law in all 50 states. And, and then there's tax law in counties we have to know. And all of that intellectual capital is, is takes a lot of time and effort. There may, there might be a way that, you know, we can put a lot of that ownership on AI and be able to deliver, um, you know, get that stuff done a lot faster and mm -hmm. provide more guidance around it as opposed to doing that work. Um, yeah. And maybe we can even have it solved for, you know, what's the best tax strategy that exists on the planet. The problem is, the problem with AI today, which will get resolved, but is that, it is the universe of information that in the open AI world looks at, it's too vast. And so it's inconsistent and incorrect often. Um, we've done a lot of tests on it. And so it looks at, you ask it a question and it looks at everything that exists for that particular area. And when oftentimes we'll give you back the wrong answer 
because it hasn't learned what the right answer is. Yeah, but over time, it, yeah. it's going to get a lot better. And this is the worst it's going to be. Correct. And it's already like. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's. I mean, kids, I've learned more than I thought I'd have to learn about vector databases and all this other stuff. That yeah, is crazy. I mean, like kids are doing book reports on it. Kids are doing like I, I I can go summarize this book for me in in one paragraph. Yep. Like I want to read a book, but summarize this for me in 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 one four paragraph page. Yeah. So I can. How do you so feel about it. that? I mean, good and bad. Yeah. Good in the in the sense that like I can get the gist of you know and, and save time and not have to read a book that takes me six eight hours, but at the same time there's like a it's it's a sad lost thing about sitting on the you know in a rainy day reading a book and just just diving in falling like diving into yeah. it and getting lost in it right like right. there's there's gonna be everything's moving too fast these yeah. days like there was some cool nostalgic things about you know, opening a record or a CD and reading all the lyrics and listening to the whole album versus like you get one single now in music and it's like, you know, what's, what's the next coolest thing. And it's just like, I think we've, we've all become more shallow and less deep and, and it's, it's same with business. I mean, you can, you can relate that to transactions versus relationships. Yeah. You know, people just want to do these transactions, transact, and then when the transactions dry up, they don't have relationships that they can go to and, and get, you know, business from. And so I think it's bad and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like fast food. It's like yeah. tastes great, but it's like, I don't feel good about this. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, that's a great analogy. Um, when things are tough, you lean on relationships, right? And that's yep. a, that's a huge, that's a huge miss. I mean, back to your other question, what's an obvious miss out there, right? It's, you know, I, the relationship part is, is critical and we'll see. I mean, AI like all things, there'll be good that comes out of it, and, I, and there'll be bad. Um, yep. It's already saved me time. A couple, <laughs> like, trying to write. Uh, me, well, I think me the when are... I forced to write a letter, it's like, <laughs> oh, I got to think through this. And, like, that's not my <laughs> that's not my wheelhouse, right? right? So I type it in, and it gets me close, and then I could tweak it a little bit. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I like that part of it for sure. But That's cool. Yeah, speaking of relationships, any uh, shout-outs you have for – Someone that's helped you along the way. Ooh, someone who's helped me out along the way. Um, there's been a lot of people who've helped me along the way. You know, uh, one I'll say my wife, who uh, I've been with um, nearly 23 years, is, is is been a big supporter. We we went through a really difficult time in the mortgage company, um, and and uh, she sat when we started the firm and looked up every FHA approved lender in the state of California and uh, entered uh, addresses in. And we sent out a postcard saying, we'll do your audit for 10% less of whatever you paid last year. And um, <laughs> we did a hundred grand that year in revenue. And that was a hundred percent because she believed in, in me and what I could do. And we've come a long way since that period of time. Um, so, so I guess it starts with her. Um, had a great mentor, a guy named Rick Goldberg that worked for a CPA firm that kind of gave me my first opportunity to be, um, to, to lead a department in a, in a CPA firm. Um, my first CFO gig, I, a lot of people. And, I, and, I, and I'll give a shout out to uh, EO, which is a part of a group that I know we're a part of. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of fellow entrepreneurs who, who helped me think bigger and, um, kind of get out of my own way as mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, which really That's changed cool. my life. And particularly a guy named uh, Drew Goodmanson, who uh, spent some, some real quality time and uh, helped. But yeah, that'd That's be cool. the shout outs. Yeah. EO is great. And, and that actually be a great thing to sponsor. If you're a mortgage broker and you wanted to sponsor yeah. EO, you can get in front of entrepreneurs who need bank statement loans. A hundred percent. It's a, <laughs> It's I a, know we talked about that. Like, in a, yeah. if I was a retail broker, I would do that in a yeah. second. Yeah, and they're big loans. Usually. They're they're big loans. Yeah. yeah, I I'm the SAP chair. It's funny <laughs> you should say that. I am the sponsorship chair. We didn't even talk about that for us, full but, disclosure. But yeah, yeah. But no. like, reach out to Bart. Yeah. How does someone reach out to you if they want to sponsor you? Just uh, send me an email or uh, send me an email. Are you going to put that in the show notes? You want me to say it? Just say it and we'll right. put it in there. It's a uh, M Wilson at C wdl.com yeah 
You can call awesome. me on my phone, yeah. 619-302-1505. You're going to get so many calls. I know. <laughs> I I don't do individual tax work anymore, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not your guy for that, but, uh, but for other stuff, yeah. You've helped us a lot, too, so I appreciate all that. And um, We're honored to have your trust. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's the end of the show. I mean, this has been great. It's been over an hour, I think, right? Kind of where yeah. we try to cut it off. But uh, if you want to hear more from Mark, reach out to him. And thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Please tell your friends about this. If you have mortgage broker friends and real estate friends, please share. Don't don't be selfish and hold this only to your ears. We're trying to grow. So any kind of uh, shout outs you do for us or you know sharing with uh, social media always helps. So thanks yeah. for listening. Yeah, we're a fan. So thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. The Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast.